Hello everybody. I uh, just wanted to put together a lesson for the boys uh, that kind of goes over some of the team concepts that we're doing. One of the biggest things that goes on in a youth game is runners at first and third. Runners at first and third, the younger you get, the more it happens. You might be thinking, you know, when I watch a pro game, you know, you don't see a lot of tricks and and different plays that you need to put on at first and third. Well, that's because those guys are so advanced. One, you don't get tons of first and thirds. In a professional game, you might see five or six hits by each team. On, on a badly pitched game, maybe 10 or 11. So those opportunities are a lot less. And, and also, those guys are able to throw the ball so much faster across the diamond, it doesn't lead to being able to uh, steal extra runs. So you, you generally see it on the pro game, it's very conservative. Well, that's what really differs in a youth game. Good teams can limit the scores of the other opponents by having a successful first and third strategy. And that goes for defense, but also how you're going to go about it offensively. Today I want to discuss the defensive aspect of first and third. And again, in a youth game, you are going to have first and third in a numerate amount of times. Um, and the younger you are, the more guys are on base, the more you can expect walks and hits, and the more times you have first and third. And, and so as a team, we want to have a strategy for that. And so today, I just want to talk to our players about this. Is this the same thing that I would normally do if we were out in the field together? Um, and we would use the field and put the players an example. So, but today, I'm going to use this whiteboard um, to kind of go over what we are doing as Bombers as a team. And we're really going to do this on the 9 all the way up into to the 15U level, um, as I think it actually is applicable for all, all age groups um, on the youth, youth level. So again, guys, when we get first and third, we have four variations of plays that the catcher will call. And I want to discuss all four of them and the reasons for them. The first variation is the one that you'll see every team do, and that is where the pitcher pitches the ball, the runner here on first base steals, steals the base, and the catcher simply throws it back to the pitcher. This guy advances, but it keeps the guy at third base. And so some of the positives there on the basic play, and again everybody runs this one, is that there's no real risk. So in a situation where we really believe that the batter is likely to get out, in a two-out situation, you'd see us call that. Maybe in a blowout, if we're up big, maybe if we're down big, there's no point in, in, in taking those sort of chances. Um, and, and it's important for the players to understand that's why we're calling it. We want to be safe in certain situations. We don't want to just play it safe in all situations. So the next play I want to discuss is, I guess you'd say the riskiest play. Um, and I say risky because your chances of the guy from third scoring are, are fairly high. When the pitcher pitches the ball in this play, the catcher is then going to throw the ball all the way down to second base as this player tries to advance. Now, the best result here is that the guy at third base would stay because he wouldn't recognize the ball is going all the way down, and the ball would get here and we would get an out. So we clear this as an out, and he would stay. The worst result being it's a late throw, or a bad throw. Ball goes into the outfield, runner goes to third, this guy scores. Coach looks real stupid if that happens. Um, but the reasons why we might do it. So and a lot of times, you know, you might be watching the game and you say, wow, that was pretty dumb execution or dumb call of that play. When really, guys, sometimes early in games or maybe late in games, there's a guy at first and third and nobody out, and you got batter two, three, four coming up. So the chances of the guy at third not scoring, again in the youth game, is very, very low. So what we're doing here, guys, is saying, 
it's worth a chance. This guy's scoring anyway, the guy from third, and maybe we get this guy out, he goes home, and we clear the bases and we give up a run. Well, with no outs, if you're able to pull that off, um, that's a very, very good result. So you're playing the percentage chances. Percentage chance again, nobody out, middle of the order, this guy's gonna score from third, and Honestly, with nobody else in the use game, he's going to steal second anyway. He's likely to score, so, so take a chance there. Um, and again, maybe you're down big and it, and it doesn't really matter. You're just trying to get outs. Maybe you're up big, same thing. You're just trying to get outs. Guys, on the Little League field, this throwdown is a great play because your chances of getting him out at second base are fairly high. On the big field, I don't necessarily love it as much because your chances of getting the guy out at second, especially at the U11 level, are really low. But then on the high school field, again, it increased, you're, you have an increased chance of getting that guy at second. So this play in the situations we just talked about is actually ends up being a smart play. Um, got two more guys that I want to go over, and this is just the defensive side, and I'll be doing other stuff on the offensive side later. This is, I would say, a bomber Pacific play. Not every team runs this. Uh, when we get guys at first and third, our third variation is a cutoff play. The first thing we want to do is have our second baseman shade over this way. So the second baseman's going to line up in, I would say, almost double play depth, but he's also probably even further than he would be. Nobody's going nobody's to notice the second baseman creeping over if he does it kind of subtly. So what we're doing here is we want this second baseman, after the ball's pitched in, to run in front of second base. And when the throw comes in, what we're hoping to have happen is to have him cut the ball in between the pitcher's mound and second base and either freeze this guy, or if he tries to jump as he sees the ball traveling over the pitcher, if he tries to jump and go home, we get him in a rundown, or we throw it home, or we throw it back to third. So the best result here is to actually get this guy out, and, it, it, and it'll work. I say, and I always tell the coaches, and in a given season, you run this play a lot, you're going to get 10, ex, 10 extra outs. Now, is there a level of risk that comes with this play? Yeah, I mean, there is. You could throw it over, throw it over. This guy could get such a good break, he could score anyway. But over, overall, if executed properly, this play is relatively safe because it's very difficult for this guy at third base to score if we're doing this correctly and this guy charges hard. Um, just quickly as an aside, what we're, we're starting to implement this year is we run the fake. So on the throwdowns, meaning the, the play that we saw before, we throw all the way down to second base, we're running this guy in front of him, he's faking it. Well, the, the runner at third in these two scenarios is really in a catch-22, right? He doesn't know. He doesn't know what we're going to do. Um, and he's almost got a freeze either way. And that's the point. If we're doing this stuff correctly, guys, this guy at third, we want him to not know what's going on. We want to tie him to the bag to where we can cut it off or we can go down and we're getting a free throw at third, right? And so I've seen this work. This play, guys, when you execute it right and everybody is on the same page, it really, it really does work, guys. And it really does give you opportunities to steal to steal outs. Lastly, there's one last play that we run that I know a lot of, a lot of teams will run this play, and I think it can be fairly effective in the right situation. Um, in this play, instead of throwing down to second base, sometimes we see these runners over at third getting monster secondary leads, meaning every time the ball's pitched, they're halfway down the line. If a coach notices that, we could, we could call our fourth option. And on the fourth option, when the pitch comes in, the catcher, without thinking about it, catches the ball and whips it to third base, straight to third base. Now, this is going to require us all to be on the same page because the third baseman has to know to jump in there directly after the pitch, and the left fielder, who's over here, you, you may not be able to see it on, on your screen, but the left fielder has to be running to back up in case of a bad throw. If everybody's moving in the right direction, this play has relatively low risk of the guy at third scoring. Because even in the, in the prospect of a bad throw to third base, the throw will then be backed up by the left fielder, and there's no way the guy here is going to score. So you get, it, you get the opportunity for an extra out. You're not just 
throwing it back to the pitcher, and you have two players that are there in case the ball goes, you know, awry. So, guys, that's our four plays in a nutshell. And I, I realize I'm running through this very fast, but all the players should have familiarity with this. On the 9U level, we're just introducing it. By the 12U level, they should have seen some, some different variations of, of this play run in games and practices. And guys, that's a lot of the benefits that we get when we're indoors, is that we can actually put the team out there and run through these scenarios. And I think it's important for the kids to see all the variations and, and what happens when, when the play actually starts. Uh, if you're just rolling out there in the game and you haven't been able to do this in the winter, then it's, it's very difficult for the kids to conceptualize it. So if you get a chance, show your kids kind of what I went through today. Um, and again, I know it's probably a lot and I'd like to maybe even get some more stuff and touch on it again and maybe slow down. I just wanted to give a brief overview to the players, even parents that, that are interested in, in what we're doing when we get first and third. And I also wanted to, to you know, hit upon the fact first and third defense from a team standpoint, that's from a team standpoint, there's obviously fielding, hitting, batting, pitching. You can't have any success if you don't have the fundamentals, and we're going to spend most of our time with that. But as a team standpoint, on the youth game, first and third ends up winning and losing You know, percentages of ball games. So being able to execute first and third, understand the different reasons for it, can, can help you win ball games. It also helps to conceptualize the game strategy. I mean, the game is about minimizing and scoring runs, and how can you be in, in, aggressive within a certain framework. This first and third puts, puts that on the team in, into a large respect. So, again, I felt like I could go on for this for 30 minutes, and I don't want this to be 30 minutes, but I think that gives you a good overview of first and third defense. And, again, what I'd like to do in subsequent weeks is maybe just barrel down on one of the plays a little bit longer and, and, and talk about why we're doing it, because I really could you know, give 10 minutes you know, kind of on each play. But I think that's a good overview and a place to start. Um, Hope you guys are all well. Hope you're social distancing. Uh, again, you know, miss you guys. And uh, hopefully we'll be out in the field executing first and thirds real soon. Bye.